So once again, good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our speaker series this month. My name is Tulsi Chase and I'm the head of education and outreach at Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. And we're very, very happy to welcome you all for our monthly virtual lecture and discussion series that highlights the research and explorations of our multidisciplinary community of scientists, global experts and thought leaders. So for those of you who might be joining our uh, series for the first time, I just want to introduce you to our center. We are a multidisciplinary research center based at the Department of Critical Care, Pain Medicine and Anesthesia at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And the work that we do is really focused on bringing tools of well-being to both patients as well as healthcare providers to enhance consciousness, cognition, and compassion. So our work happens at the nexus of research, education, and outreach. We offer wellness programs, conduct scientific studies in various communities, and we also bring together world leaders from diverse fields to collaborate and innovate health and well-being solutions. So you can learn more about our center uh, with a link that I'll put into the chat that will lead you to our website. But without further ado, I would, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Joseph Odette, who is an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School. And Dr. Odette earned his medical degree at Harvard Medical School in 1991. He completed a residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York in 1995 and is also board certified in PM&R and pain. While in New York, he trained at the Tri-State School of Traditional Chinese Medicine. For the last 20 years, he has been active on both a research basis and also clinically integrating Chinese and complementary and alternative therapies. Currently, he is the chief of the Department of Pain and Spine at Atreus Health and is also the course director of an internationally recognized physician training course in acupuncture called Integrated Structural Acupuncture. His research interests include myofascial pain, Chinese medicine and Japanese acupuncture, as well as chronic pain. And he has lectured nationally and internationally on these topics. So we're really lucky to have Dr. Odette talking with us today on acupuncture for medical providers. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Odette. Thank you for being here. Okay, thank you. And so anyway, today we're gonna to talk about the art and science of acupuncture. And I do want this to be an introduction to acupuncture for medical providers. And as we go through this talk, hopefully you'll see why I believe this is more and more important as, as medicine tries to integrate a more holistic view in terms of how to help so many of the patients that we see. So let me get this going. Um, and acupuncture is actually a, a, a medical discipline in many parts of the world. And it's a growing aspect of, of physician practices in the US, but it's still quite small. Uh, if we look at what does it mean to be a medical acupuncturist? It's really the clinical discipline of acupuncture is practiced by a physician who is also trained and licensed in Western biomedicine. So an ideal medical acupuncture really is able to integrate these two different worldviews of how to, how, to make, how to help patients improve their health and, and improve the qualities of their lives. And I think it's true that, to say that a medical acupuncture physician uniquely offers a comprehensive approach to healthcare, which combines classic and modern forms of acupuncture with conventional medicine. And really integration of those is I think the key to the future of medicine. In other parts of the world, for example, in Germany, which is a much smaller country than the US obviously, over 30,000 physicians regularly practice acupuncture. In France and Italy, unlike the United States, acupuncture is a medical practice. There really are no uh, uh, non-physician acupuncture practices, practice, practitioners in those countries. And in Brazil, acupuncture has actually become a medical specialty. And there's actually residencies that you can do in Brazil in acupuncture. Uh, in, obviously in the United States, the majority of acupuncturists 
are non-physicians and are, are very well trained. They often will go through a three or four year course of training after they've received either a BA or a BS. And so are, there are roughly now about 35,000 licensed acupuncturists in the United States. And I think we'll see, there have been a growing number of physician acupuncturists in the United States. There is an organization, the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture. Uh, and there, the standard training program for physicians with more of a biomedical approach is about 300 hours. And uh, we'll talk about that if, if, if people have more questions later. So in terms of the organization, there are um, probably about 1500 members in this, this, this organization, the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture. And there is this international organization, the International Council of Medical Acupuncture and Related Techniques that comprises about 35,000 physicians and includes about 80 medical acupuncture associations across the world. So if we look at the origins of acupuncture, we really have to look at this, this, this canon of acupuncture called the Yellow Emperor's Internal Classic. And it really codified the practice of acupuncture in China. And it was set up as a discussion between the emperor and this, this expert named Chibo. And it was felt to be historically, if we look at that text, to be written somewhere between the fifth and the first century BC. And there are two main books called the Su Wen and Ling Shu, each 81 chapters long. Uh, it's sort of like the Red Sox, you know, they pay 81 home games, 81 away games. So there's something about that that is important. And 81 is, is a very important number from a numerologic standpoint uh, in a Chinese medical system. But what's interesting, if you look at it historically in the development of this text, it really is a major shift from how medicine was practiced in China prior to that time. And prior to that time, really, all the historical evidence suggests that it really was more of a shamanistic worldview of medicine, that it was more, as you would see in many ancient cultures, of the clinician sort of interacting with these, these entities that are suprahuman, that are in this, you know, this worldview of demons and gods and so on. And so not really anything at all like modern medicine. And suddenly, out of really nowhere, if they look at the historical um, roots of this, this, this um, Neijing text, suddenly comes this totally different worldview of how to treat disease, where it was really more of an internal medicine model, no longer the shamanistic view where to, to help someone get better, you had to appeal to the gods. Suddenly, it was really trying to find a way to work on a physiologic and energetic basis with the human being as that human being interacts with the heavens and, and, and their environment, the earth. And many people suggest that there may have been Ayurvedic origins to this because they really cannot see a, a historical record of remnants of this change in view in China itself. And so there's a great interest in trying to understand this early connection uh, between these different cultures and how that led to this, this text that led to ultimately the practice of acupuncture and herbal medicine uh, that's developed through the last 2000 years in China. So if we look at the philosophical origins of this, it is very different, even though it is an internal medicine text, it's very different than the reductionist model that, that we're so used to in our biomedical approach to care and really is based on a Taoist view that we can think of as more relativistic than reductionistic. And so as a physician trying to integrate this, in this into your practice, into your worldview, into your view of how you can help your patients and your own health, it really brings in a, a, this, this concept of holism, where you try to integrate and understand how the whole organism integrates in terms of not separating out the different organs, understanding that there's an interaction between the different organs, there's an interaction between the human being and their environment, and the human being and even what we call the heavens or the, the spiritual side of, of what it means to be human. And so this is really, I think, important in our 
modern culture of medicine, which I think alienates a lot of patients uh, in, in how we all have become so some compartmentalized in, our, in our, each of our practices. And so often patients are tossed around from one specialist to another and, and don't find someone that they can really help, help them work as a whole towards regaining their health and regaining the kind of quality of life that many of them are seeking. So in that regard, it, it can be a real beautiful compliment to the more reductionist side of our training. So what, what are the origins of the science, especially in the last 30 or 40 years? And really, if you look back, the, the first major publication that put acupuncture on a scientific map was this, this publication in 1998 that was in JAMA, where the National Institute of, Institute of Health held a consensus meeting and developed a statement looking at, well, what was the state of acupuncture scientifically at that time? And at that time, they could really only give strong endorsement for the use of acupuncture to control post-operative and chemotherapy-induced nausea, with only really weak support for the thing that we nowadays think should be the mainline treatment of acupuncture, and that is the treatment of pain. But at that time, the studies were very poor in the world of pain. And and yet, despite that, there was high level evidence for the use of it in, in the post-operative setting, not only for pain, but also to reduce nausea and vomiting. Despite that evidence, of course, it was never integrated into a hospital system. And the question is why? Now in Germany, where, as I mentioned, over 30,000 physicians regularly practice acupuncture at the University of Munich, which is one of the main hospital systems in Germany, they have now made it a standard of care that all patients that are, um, that, that are going for surgeries will have a pre-op protocol where they get certain acupuncture points um, placed prior to the surgery to help with nausea and pain control. And this is really evidence-based. There's, there's as good evidence for this as any, any anti-nausea medication, any, anything that we would normally think as a conventional approach to treating this. And so they're doing that. It's actually saving the system money. There's good reasons for it. And, and, and so I, I think that we should think about that as we move forward is why would that be so difficult to, uh, to, get, uh, to move forward in the, in the U.S.? Is it a financial issue? Probably not, because if you really look at outcomes, it's cheaper. But I think often what we see in the West Certainly at some points throughout the West, but I think a lot of what we see in the US is a paradigm rigidity. And there's some kind of inherent bias, I think, against non-pharmacologic options or non-surgical options for, for conventional care. And that which, that's what makes it often so difficult to integrate some of these, these, these systems like acupuncture, certainly like uh, movement therapies, like meditation therapies, like yogic breathing and so on into the mainstream of care. But I think that's shifting. And now is the time to try to move this forward in this country as well. So if we look at the further development of acupuncture since that, that consensus statement put out by the NIH, there really has been more research on acupuncture than any other so-called alternative or complementary medicine modality. And what's interesting, there have been papers also published showing how the advancement in acupuncture research has really paralleled the advancement of our basic understanding of the pain modulatory system. In, in fact, some people will argue that the whole discovery of endorphins actually depended on an acupuncture model, an acupuncture mouse model that they were using in China. And certainly the whole understanding of the descending pain modulatory system, as well as cortical pain modulatory systems were developed in parallel to understanding how acupuncture can influence pain first in animal models and then eventually in humans. So it's an interesting development of the science and, and the basic science of how acupuncture can modulate these systems is again as secure as any any drug that you could use in this setting but again it's often not looked at um, um, within a conventional care system as a viable alternative for pain management and we'll as of course keep talking about that as we go through this in terms of clinical evidence now there have been beautiful meta-analyses this is one published in the archives of internal medicine 
by Vickers and all who um, have looked at a number of pain models, whether it's osteoarthritis of the knee, low back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, tension type headaches, migraine, and looked at acupuncture versus sham acupuncture, which we'll talk about in a second. And also, of course, acupuncture versus a non-acupuncture control, which is obviously always a more controversial kind of study, but often these non-acupuncture controls will be what we call usual care. So this, of course, doesn't take into the placebo response, but if we just look at outcomes, the benefit of acupuncture over, for these various pain conditions as compared to usual care is outstanding. The effect size is extremely large. As soon as we introduce a sham acupuncture control, the effect size is smaller, but still significant for all of these pain conditions. So really at this point, you, can, you, you really are on solid ground saying that acupuncture has a clear effect that's more so than uh, a placebo effect in these pain, various pain conditions and really in, in, the, in the world of chronic pain in general. The problem with these sham acupuncture placebo controls is that they're not an actual inert placebo control. They're really an active control. And so they played around with how to do this type of sham needling where they've had some studies where you have standard needling depth and you ideally potentially don't manipulate the needle. So there's no de chi sensation, which is a typical sensation that you sometimes get if you manipulate the needle aggressively. They'll sometimes do other studies where they use points off meridian or off in a location that's felt to be not important for that particular condition. So there are different ways that they've tried to introduce the sham needle, but in all of these cases, the needle is penetrating the skin. And as soon as a needle or a sharp object penetrates the skin, there's this huge neurologic response to that that's called the diffuse noxious inhibitory control system, that your body is sensing some kind of trauma, even though in this case, it's a very small trauma with a needle. And so the sending pain modulatory system kicks in. And so that's why it's really not an inert placebo. And as we know with all drug studies, as soon as you introduce an active placebo, the results and the effect size is often much less. And we see that with acupuncture as well, but still with these large meta-analyses, it has shown that, that act, the true acupuncture is superior to the sham control. Another thing that we don't do in the world of acupuncture is we don't discriminate the style and types of acupuncture. We look at acupuncture as this monolithic type of, of treatment that is it's just not the case that that's true. And unfortunately, we've never moved towards studies to try to distinguish, is this Chinese style of acupuncture superior for migraine headaches over maybe this Korean hand style of acupuncture? Or So there's been no attempt to really look at these different styles of acupuncture, whether one or another could be more or less successful. So as you, you can see with these uh, meta-analysis, this is one on the back pain that um, basically looks at um, studies that favor acupuncture. So those are these studies over here, those versus those that do not favor. No one really looks at, okay, what's the difference between these studies that cross midline, suggesting that acupuncture is no better than sham control versus those studies that do not cross the, the midline. And so we can say, clearly the acupuncture is superior to the control group and that type of acupuncture. We just look at it as a whole. And this is not what we do in conventional medicine. So this is an example of a meta-analysis looking at antidepressants for the treatment of chronic pain. And with these types of studies in the conventional world, we'll always say, well, of course, if we look at some of these studies where the, there was no superiority between the active treatment and the placebo, we'll say, well, yes, from a mechanistic standpoint, that's an SSRI. And we know that SSRI, SSRI, such as paroxetine, are less likely due to these mechanistic features to help with chronic pain, as opposed to, say, a tricyclic antidepressant, like amipramine or doxapin and so on. And so this type of discrimination has not really been done yet for acupuncture. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to look at as we go forward to try to better understand what is it that, that makes an acupuncture trial more successful? Is it the style of acupuncture? Is there something about the protocol? 
that makes it work better and work in a, a superior way to the, the, the placebo or sham control. So here's just a quick example of that type of differentiation. So this is a so-called optimized acupuncture trial that was done in Germany, looking at chronic low back pain. And they had an enrollment of 150 subjects, which was a sufficiently powered study. All patients received what was considered usual care at that point, which was 26 sessions of physical therapy. And they either then were also randomized to a verum or true acupuncture treatment or a sham acupuncture treatment in a robust way. So they got a lot of some of the early studies in acupuncture for chronic pain, a patient would only get four sessions of acupuncture. So to try to avoid those types of errors where you're, you're not really providing a sufficiently powerful style of acupuncture, this study allowed the patients to get 20 uh, treatments five times a week for two weeks and then once a week for, for 10 weeks. And so a really well-powered, seemingly well-designed study. The sham treatment was pretty robust as well, though. They were getting superficial needle placement through the skin that was off point, off meridian. And they, in this case, in the sham group, they got no auricular or ear points done, whereas in the varum group, they also had ear points in addition to body points. And in the sham needling, they just put the needle through the skin, but they did not manipulate the needle to induce the the chi response as they did in the varum group. So that was their sham treatment. And what's interesting is both groups showed significant improvement in the pain and functional impairment scores over that group that just got physical therapy alone, but there was no significant difference between the sham and the varum acupuncture group, both immediately following treatment and at nine months follow-up. So it's this kind of study that's led many of my colleagues and, and many people around the world to say, oh, acupuncture, it's great, but it's all placebo. Maybe it's a very elaborate placebo, so it's a powerful placebo type of intervention, but it's still just a placebo effect. But I hope to show you that that's not the case. And as we can, as we can see with previous slides, there are these meta-analyses looking deeper at this that show that, it's, that it is superior to the sham treatment. But one of the things about this study, as opposed to this following study that I'm gonna show you, is all the patients in this study got the same acupuncture treatment. So regardless of the kind of chronic low back pain they had, they each, all of them got the same points in the Verum acupuncture group. Contrast that to this subsequent study that was done also in Germany, where another randomized controlled trial where everyone in the acupuncture and sham group also got the, what they're calling conventional orthopedic treatment. And then there was a third group that just got that conventional orthopedic treatment alone. It was well powered, 186 subjects. The conventional orthopedic Treatment is conventional for Germany, but maybe not so conventional for the United States because they were also getting mud packs and infrared treatments and so on. But they were also getting diclofenac and anti-inflammatory and some typical physical therapy in back school. The treatment was a little bit less intense than the previous study. They um, either got the sham or the acupuncture treatment for 12 sessions, three times a week for four weeks. The sham acupuncture was a minimal acupuncture like the previous study. So they went off point, inserted the needle, but did not manipulate it. And the acupuncture itself was done by an expert clinician. And the difference between this study and the previous study is that this expert clinician was allowed to pick three or four extra points based on his clinical assessment of the patient to individualize that. So they had certain points that were standardized in all the patients but this clinician was able to make some decisions within a certain range of possible points that would allow him to individualize the treatment for each patient. And that difference alone led to this tremendous difference in outcome where the varum acupuncture immediately after treatment, as well as at three months follow-up, was significantly superior to both the sham treatment as well as to the conventional orthopedic care alone. So, just by that individualization, getting away from a standard protocol uh, that they would use on every patient, but instead, as you would normally in almost every clinical session, individualize the care for a specific condition, including something like low back pain, they suddenly were able to show a vast separation between the sham and the varum treatment. So this is where 
being a little bit more critical and understanding the differences between these different studies can make a difference in understanding uh, the, you know, that acupuncture can be something much more than a placebo effect. Now, I've done some work now with my colleague at um, Mass General. His name is Vitaly Nabadov, who's in the uh, functional imaging section of Mass General. But we've started to be able to show that acupuncture can also influence neuroplasticity. And this is an interesting issue that is a major problem in, in the world of pain in that when the theory now about what happens in someone with chronic pain is that it's so difficult to treat because there have been actual changes, structural plasticity changes in the central nervous system that have in a sense codified that pain signaling, even though the peripheral, the original injury may have healed, the central nervous system is still acting, responding and sending signals to the cortical level. And even at the cortical level, you can have these neuroplastic changes that leave the patient in a state of chronic pain and chronic uh, functional impairment. So there have been animal models showing that acupuncture can reverse these structural plastic plasticity changes in, in, um, in animal models of chronic pain. And then we were able to show it in a human model using carpal tunnel syndrome as a model for neuropathic pain. And so this is a quick summary of this. We don't have time to go through the details of the study in great depth, but this is an idea of how, even in something that you may think of as benign as carpal tunnel syndrome, when it's chronic, leads the cortical uh, 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 system of that patient to become sensitized. So this is what a person with carpal tunnel looks like, chronic carpal tunnel syndrome. When you provide a small stimulus to the second and third digit, uh, to that individual, it's slightly painful stimulus uh, to their fingers. Their brain lights up both in the sensory motor cortex as well as in the limbic system, not only on the contralateral side of the brain, given that that sensory inf information is crossing over to the contralateral side, but even on the ipsilateral side. So it's like your brain is overreacting to that sensory stimuli. And then what we did was um, get this baseline testing, both standard testing for carpal tunnel with nerve conduction studies. We did this functional magnetic resonance imaging um, with stimulation on digit two, three, and five as our control digit because five is not innervated by the median nerve. So that's our control digit in this setting. And we did it at baseline. Then they got five weeks of acupuncture, a total of 13 treatments. And then five weeks later, we retested them, um, both looking at nerve conduction studies, uh, subjective questions of how their symptoms were, as well as the functional MRI imaging. And what we were able to do now um, in, in our most recent study is not only have a treatment arm where the treatment was local to the, the limb where they had the carpal tunnel with these points, but we had a, another group where we did a distal treatment. So even though, say, for example, they had carpal tunnel symptoms in their right hand, we would treat the left ankle based on acupuncture theory uh, in um, terms of points that should be helpful for that and provided no treatment to their, to their affected hand and tried to see if that would also have some type of effect on their symptoms on the imaging findings, as well as on their nerve conduction findings. And then we also had a placebo group where they got a placebo needle stimulation off meridian, off point on, the, on either the ankle um, or, the, or the affected limb for the placebo control group. And what we were able to show in the active treatment, those treatments, those patients that got either active treatment in their affected limb, the arm, the hand, or in the contralateral ankle, they both showed this significant effect with a, a general desensitization of the central nervous system. So this is what a brain looks like with that stimulation, that painful stimulation of the second and third finger if you do not have carpal tunnel. And we were able to bring those patients with carpal tunnel after five weeks of treatment to that same state where mostly the limbic system shows a rel relative deactivation, and we get slight activation of the sensory motor cortex on the contralateral um, cortex. 
So another thing we were able to show whether we treated locally or in the opposite ankle was that we could get this change in the mapping of the second, third and fifth digit um, um, and, and undo the effect of carpal tunnel on that, uh, that mapping. So in a normal healthy person, if you stimulate digit two or digit three or digit five as you're imaging, you can distinguish on the sensory motor cortex where those three uh, uh, parts or those uh, where, the, where that part of the brain lights up relative to those three digits. And so this is what a healthy brain looks like. This is what someone with carpal tunnel looks like. Digit two and three blur. So they, you can't see a distinction. The, the two points blur on imaging when you stimulate either digit three or digit two in patients with carpal tunnel. But after five weeks of acupuncture, we were able to show that digit two, three, and five separated again and look similar to the healthy control patients. So in general, then, given the basic science, given that we have evidence not only that acupuncture works on um, a clinical level for pain, but even maybe can reverse neuroplasticity, the question is why is acupuncture not being utilized more um, in this situation that we're in now in the world of pain uh, related to the opioid crisis? And so that's the big question. Why isn't acupuncture part of this mainstream? And I, I think it's, again, lack of training, lack of understanding of the science, but also partly this issue of paradigm shift that it's, it's very hard for many clinicians who are versed and trained in the standard scientific model that is very reductionist to understand something like how could treatment of someone's left ankle with acupuncture needles help someone with carpal tunnel in the right hand. It's just, it's sort of outside the realm of understanding, even though there can be neuroanatomical mechanisms that we could discuss, but it does start to stretch your understanding of how the body works. And so this paradigm shift, I think, is one of the problems that we face. But despite that, um, we're, we're kind of carrying along here in this world where there's so many patients that have been injured in the pain field by the the sort of unrestrained use of opioids to manage their pain. I don't want to have to, I don't think we have time to go through the history of it all, but it was uh, quite tragic. And as we know, when it was felt that opioids were a viable treatment for chronic pain, there was this huge rise in opioid related overdose and addiction that paralleled that increase in the use of opioids for the treatment of various non-cancer pain conditions. And so this has really reached a crisis level, as we know, and um, ultimately has led, I think, people to start to think about using acupuncture, but not in a very uh, organized or effective way to actually help our patients. And remember, at the peak of this crisis, the United States was consuming 80% of the world's oxycodone and 99% of the world's hydrocodone. And that just tells you how our medical system tends to be so deeply wedded to a pharmacologic approach to the treatment of everything, including pain. And so that's where we really need to start thinking about how to educate our colleagues in this paradigm shift to start letting them realize that there are other options for our patients. And so the question is, can acupuncture be one of many modalities that can solve the opioid crisis? And certainly many Organizations are thinking along these same lines. The American College of Physicians published recent practice guidelines for the treatment of acute and chronic low back pain, and acupuncture was considered an evidence-based option for those conditions. The FDA has now printed a blueprint for healthcare providers, how to manage pain, and acupuncture, again, recommended as an evidence-based option. The Joint Commission now endorses acupuncture as a first-line treatment for pain, and the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine is, as of 2017, was recommending an increased use of the non-pharmacologic approaches of pain management, obviously as part of that, including acupuncture. Despite this, it's really not being integrated into a hospital or outpatient um, care level, and this is a problem. Now, what's interesting is the Department of Defense, because of the nature of how healthcare is delivered in 
in both uh, the military as well as in the VA system has been much more successful integrating these non-pharmacologic modalities into care. And part of the issue that was driving them was this same issue of the opioid crisis. And so the Army Surgeon General set up a task force and actually as of 2010 had already made this report recommending a more comprehensive pain management strategy that was more holistic, multidisciplinary and multimodal approach for military, um, um, for members of the military and um, the VA system. And they've been very active in implementing that in the military in a way that we would, that we would be amazed at as we look in, um, in the, you know, the world of medicine that we work in where it's still not part of the, of the mainstream of what we provide. And so the Department of Defense was able to provide the tools and the infrastructure and support that allowed this to move forward um, and really a full spectrum of treatments. It's not just acupuncture, mind-body approaches, uh, all types of movement therapies and um, psychologically based uh, treatments as well. But acupuncture was a mainstream component of this effort. And so one of the ways that they were able to do this was through um, the work of an of a, a Air Force colonel named Dr. Niemsau, who had training in acupuncture, interestingly. He developed this standard protocol called battlefield acupuncture. And it was a very easy protocol to, earn, uh, to learn just five basic points. They did some early studies within the military system to show uh, efficacy on pain. And then they immediately rolled it out and started training everyone in this approach. Physicians, APCs, med techs throughout the clinical care system. So now if, if some um, poor, uh, poor member of the army is you know, getting injured out in the field, as soon as they are in clinical care, they're getting these points treated in addition to anything else that's done to stabilize them medically. And often what they're seeing is in that acute, subacute care, they're requiring far less amount of opioids. And they're using this to try to prevent that addiction from developing in, these, in, in, in their military vets. And so it's, it's been a tremendous um, response by the military, but unfortunately we're lagging in, um, in the traditional healthcare settings that we all work in. So unfortunately, what's been left for so many of our patients is now that the opioid crisis has really been realized to be an issue, that we don't want to just start giving our patients opioids to you know, potentially help their pain, we do nothing. So there's really been what I see in the field of medicine throughout, throughout the system, not just in pain, but in, in you know, the primary care setting and the urgent care setting, is there's a sort of a loss of compassion. So the, everyone recognizes that they don't want to write those prescriptions for oxycodone or hydrocodone, but they don't offer anything else. Maybe they'll offer, like I've had recently uh, a patient that was aggressively offered a non anti-inflammatory and he's in, he has renal failure. You know, like he's, you know, he's like right on the border of, of, of going into dialysis and they're trying to offer him non anti-inflammatories that'll just tip them over the edge. But on the other hand, they don't want to give them opioids. I've even had cancer patients coming to me from Dana-Farber who just had some kind of terrible lymphatic node dissection in their armpit, irritated uh, their, um, the, the nerves and their axilla. They're getting severe neuropathic pain down the arm and no treatment, no pain treatment is given to them. So really we've got to start being more aggressive about integrating these alternatives. They can be very powerful. They're not weak. They're not weak because they're non-pharmacological, but there is going to require a paradigm shift. And ideally, if we can have more physicians even train on some level in some of these basic techniques, not just physicians, but maybe like the military, our APCs really spread it through the healthcare system, even if it's some of these more basic systems like battlefield acupuncture, we can be better for our patients and feel better about what we can offer our patients and not have that sort of loss of compassion that's permeating medicine at this point. So really the art of acupuncture opens a whole new perspective on the complexity of our patient presentations. It will allow us as clinicians to shift our focus from a purely reductionist view of the body 
and gives us a language and a structure to understand the whole person again. And the way these interconnected set of symptoms that the, sometimes a patient presents to us that often in the past would just be noise. I don't wanna hear about your headache, I'm the liver specialist. Suddenly from an acupuncture standpoint says, oh yeah, acupuncture, yeah, liver problems, they always cause headaches from an acupuncture standpoint. So suddenly we can hear our patient and think of them as a whole human being. So it's really not just about putting needles. In fact, to be a clinician of, uh, that is understanding acupuncture, you may never need to put a needle in a person and yet you can still provide better care than we're providing now to our patients. So I think as we move forward, as we start to integrate more of these things, we'll understand that this gives us an opportunity to be with the patient in a relaxed state, an opportunity to look at them as a whole person, to be able to better give them lifestyle counseling and to be really present with the patient. If none of you have seen this TED talk by Abraham Verghese, uh, A Doctor's Touch, I strongly recommend that. Dr. Abraham Verghese is a physician. He wrote this wonderful novel called Cutting for Stone, but he does this beautiful uh, TED talk about how touch has been lost in medicine and how we have to bring that back. And trying to get that connectedness back to our, to our contact with patients is so important. So I think in the front lines, ultimately, if we look at our future, it really can't just be physicians. We have to think about how we can train APCs and clinicians in general in these non-pharmacologic approaches, not just acupuncture. And we need more research in this to look at not just is acupuncture better than a placebo, but more about if we integrate acupuncture and some of these other non-pharmacologic approaches to the care of our patients, can we see changes on quality measures, changes on patient satisfaction, and most importantly, changes in cost effectiveness. So acupuncture can take many forms. It doesn't require a patient to lie down on a table, and that's the beauty of the ear acupuncture. There are very uh, neuroanatomically based uh, Western styles of acupuncture that are based on electroacupuncture, a neuroanatomic acupuncture based on our understanding of the pain modulatory system and central sensitization uh, that includes this concept of segmental desensitization. There are dry needling approaches, as I can show you here. There's a very simple technique you can lose, use with an acupuncture needle to help people with various pain conditions where you can release the tension and muscle very quickly. Uh, with minimal pain because you're using a very tiny needle with this approach. And you can do some dramatic things. So I'm going to, for a second, unplug my mic so you can hear through this. This is uh, through our physician training course where we're, um, we're basically uh, letting one of the students, this student has just learned acupuncture. This is a very well-known uh, physician acupuncturist from Brazil. And she's, uh, oops, sorry. Um, she's going to see if the student can treat this, this uh, other physician, he's actually a surgeon, see if uh, she can treat his shoulder pain. So just, it's a brief video, but uh, let's see if we can get this to run. Oh no, I always hit it when the little circle is running in my mouth. Oh, let's go backwards. Okay. And hopefully you can hear this as it's going on. So he has very poor shoulder range of motion. You can only get this abduction of the shoulder up to about 90 degrees. And then where is uh, the point that it, it hurts? It's painful. Is it inside or is it here or is it here? It starts now along the, the triceps edge there. Okay. And then it comes in there, then it starts to at the top of the shoulder there. Okay. So you have to test all the, the, the other movements. So you ask the, the patient to do this, but you, you, he should reach the other ear, right? Into the, to reach other ear. Yes. <laughs> Without cheating. So this is his limit. Oh, so this is here, it's not the... the... <laughs> yeah, I know. So also, like this, Yes, it doesn't work. Yes, and like this. So do you see that he has a difference, yeah. right? So he has 
a limitation of this uh, abduction and also this movement. Right. So this is it. You have just 30 seconds to ask the patient. So neuralgia, <laughs> shoulder pain, and uh, lateral, and okay, what's the diagnosis and what do you want to do with one needle? Why? So it's just a fact. You can do whatever you want as long as you, as long as you just a fact. Okay. Mm, just if I, no, ju, ju, um, if you think that a small intestine comes here and comes there and to the shoulder, okay, come here, let's, let's do, let's try. And I want to be sure. So she is thinking about uh, the main channel, right? The uh, small intestine, and then she wants to circulate the, the chi, right? This is the, 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 the thought. From zero to 10, uh, what's the scale of the pain right now? Let me do this one. Six, seven. Six, seven. <laughs> She's testing the point with her finger before she puts the needle in to see if it could help a little bit. Yes. So the best way, I I so no manipulation. She just puts the needle in, just simple insertion. No, usually you see that like you have a network of circulation with sheep. Whoa, look at that. So basically you can see it can be powerful. That's just the student. She's just, just started her acupuncture journey. So there's amazing things that can happen. And you should always think about acupuncture as an approach when standard treatments are not helping. But ideally we start to move it more and more towards the front line where it may be our first line treatment in certain cases, but ultimately we have to begin to integrate this into our care. So I'll stop there because I know probably it may have gone too long. I hope not. I'm going to stop the share and bring it back to the group. And I'm going to plug myself back in. Here. So thank you okay. so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. It's just impressive. Uh, for many of us who have heard of acupuncture and looked at the literature but not really done it, uh, invites us for that. So I have some questions about acute post-operative pain, right? Uh, right. This one is there is a lot of uh, interest about reducing opioids, especially older patients, etc. So for them, let's say we do uh, an abdominal surgery, one right. shot of insertion of acupuncture. What is the duration of its effect? Like whether it's an adjunct or a primary treatment, how long will it last? Right. Well, it can be variable. And that's the problem with just using standard body point needles like you saw in that video. So there have been beautiful studies done. Uh, one that I think of in particular that was done in, in, in Japan where they used uh, what we call intradermal needles. So these are little needles. They're sterile, but they're attached to a piece of tape so that they can stay in. You put them in in the pre-op setting. They stay in throughout the operation and they stay in in the post-op period. And what they did for something like they had people getting abdominal surgery, people getting um, a surgery that more in the chest region, they just used a segmental neuroanatomic approach. So they just put these needles along the spine in the, uh, the segment that you think, you know, relative to that region of surgery that you're gonna do. And they would, you know, maybe put four or five needles on each side, just intersegmentally, and the outcome was 
uh, amazing. And I keep hoping that someone, everybody that takes our course say, that's an anesthesiologist. I show them that study, say, hey, we have to try to redo this. But that's a way you can get a sustained effect. So you're not just kind of putting a needle and stimulating and then hoping it lasts or finding a way, how can we get that needle back in the person? But there are these, uh, these needle techniques where you can leave the needle in um, with the, for example, these intradermal needles that will last and they're sterile for three to five days um, without cost. And these are intradermal needles. You don't have to do anything with them. You just leave them in. You don't have to do yeah. anything. Just put them in. It's amazing. That's, that's why this idea that the sham needling, you know, a lot of these sham needle protocols, they would just put a needle in, but not manipulate it. So there was this theory that if you don't manipulate the needle, you're not going to get any effect. But there have been so many studies on, you saw with that woman doing that one point, she just put the needle in, no manipulation. So just that stimulation, or in this case, for the, it was a study by this group, um, uh, the lead author was named Kotani. Um, they just put the interdermal needles in, no manipulation, just like little tacks, boom, 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 um, based on the level of the surgery. And they only put them on the back. Um, so away from the surgical field and, and had tremendous reduction in opioid use, reduction even in uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting. And what is the neuroanatomical basis for how acupuncture works? Yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. So we all forget, you know, like I, as I've gone through this, I've had to review my neuroanatomy of pain, but it's, we forget. So you have this, the spinal root coming out and it splits into a ventral and a dorsal root right so that that dorsal the ventral root is the one we think of as our dermatomes or even our mind you know the ventral root the one that's more anterior goes to the limb or goes to the abdomen but the dorsal root goes to the cutaneous structures over um, the spine at that level so by you know from a neuroanatomic standpoint you're stimulating that dorsal uh, part of the root and then theoretically can therefore uh, through some kind of gate control mechanism, influence um, that segment of the spinal cord um, and avoid going, you know, where you're doing the surgery, for example, um, ventrally, uh, you know, on the, on the abdomen. It's more like a descending innovation and avoiding the stimuli reaching the central portions. Yeah, we would call that more of a segmental inhibition based on more gate theory, um, you know, kind of the very basic Melzac and Wall gate theory where you're because when you stimulate with an acupuncture needle you're definitely stimulating large fibers you're not just stimulating the the c fibers or the a delta fibers you're getting uh some of the larger fibers to stimulate which from the basic melzac and wall gate theory is going to have an effect on the inhibitory neurons in the center in, in the level of the spinal cord and and help reduce the afferent drive uh to the cortex so, and uh, one last question before I let others is the reimbursement model, right? For example, if you use the acupuncture yeah. for these patients, whether surgical setting or in the chronic pain setting, um, it, you know, insurance reimburses for this, right? Right. Well, so here's the thing. So in a, in a hospital model, no, no reimbursement. I can't imagine there ever will be. But that's where outcome studies, and that's where, for example, at the University of Munich, they've made it a standard of care to do, they're more focused on the post-operative nausea and vomiting, but they are seeing benefits on pain control as well, where they're reducing costs. So if you have like a DRG model where you get a certain bundle payment for surgery X, Y, and Z, if you can reduce use of expensive medicines, reduce hospital stay, It'll, it'll be worth it for the organization, even though you can't bill for putting those interdermal needles in, in a pre-op setting. In an outpatient setting, certainly you can bill. And um, you know, as of now, historically, had it been largely uh, a, a self-pay model, but that's changing. So Medicare in um, a, a year and a half ago has now approved the use of acupuncture for low back pain. And they're using that as a kind of a beginning model to see what, it, what, what the experience is with that. But I'm sure we're gonna to start to see Medicare approving neck pain and other, other pain conditions um, for acupuncture so that it would actually be covered by Medicare. 
already in the Boston area, there's, you know, depending, of course, on the carve out of the company that you work for, but many people with Blue Cross and Tufts and a little bit Harvard Pilgrim insurance are starting to now have acupuncture coverage. What's interesting is the, some of the best coverage is with some of, uh, for example, mass, uh, you know, in our organization, we call it, it's a Tufts product, but it's really, um, you know, the, the um, Medic, um, Medicaid product that does cover acupuncture for chronic pain. So there is a, there, I couldn't have said this five years ago, five years ago, if you had asked me, I'd say outpatient, it's all self-pay with very few exceptions. I would say now it's 50-50 in terms of the coverage uh, for acupuncture, but inpatient, it would have to be part of a kind of a bundled activity. There, there's no way to bill for it independently, I don't think. Joe, thank you so much. I'll let yes. others ask. Thank okay, you. sure. Uh, hello, my name is Ali. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was really great. I really enjoyed it. I'm acupuncturist. I trained at Bastyr University, and, and I'm a doctorate student there. I'm finishing my doctorate in acupuncture. I just want to to share some of my um, thoughts, thoughts and um, stories I had from my training. Part of our training for, for pain management was, uh, was at Harborview Hospital in Seattle, and we had a chance mm -hmm. to treat actually inpatients. And uh, yep. we were under actually pain management team and we were treating patients who had uh, really uh, low actually outcome with uh, opioids or other treatments or they couldn't sleep, for example, or they had uh, uh, several, uh, I want to say, uh, problems with stress, anxiety, and acupuncture actually did help so much with those patients. And the pain group actually was amazed that we can, sometimes we just one treatment, patients could sleep after many nights of not sleeping, or the pain decreased from 10 out of 10 to one out of 10. And the pain management was like, oh my God, what did you do? Because we just put some needles distally even, because at inpatient setting, you can't sometimes even touch the body. You can just treat right. either the ear yeah, or- very the simple protocols, yeah. Yes. And that was but, yeah, and I think uh, as you t mentioned that, I'm sure another thing that has not been looked at but should be is constipation. You know yes. how many patients cannot be discharged home until they have a bowel movement. Yes, and yes. On, I mean the effect on ac uh, that acupuncture has on inducing peristalsis is is incredible, and yet you know no one's really I think looked at it. <laughs> but there's so many areas where it could it could save a hospital so much money and improve the experience of the patient so much compared to what, you know, unfortunately many of them experience in a hospital setting. So yeah. thank you. Yes, I agree. That's a great experience. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for these questions. I think we have a question in the chat uh, from Alka. Okay. Uh, she says, thank you for the great talk. How do you foresee the future for acupuncture in the next five or 10 years now with COVID in the picture and chronic pain dramatically increasing with regards to integration with mainstream medicine? Well, I hope that it's a spur to integrate more. I, I certainly know that I have so many patients now who have suffered the ill effects of COVID and have what's considered long haul COVID or some of these ongoing symptoms of shortness of breath or sometimes dysregulation of their autonomic nervous system, various things that they're struggling with. And, and so many of the conventional treatments just don't seem to be touching their symptoms. And the only place that I've seen some evidence coming out that, that other than China, that it's, that it's a viable treatment is the military again. Of course, the military is, is being very proactive with this, but it should be a viable option for these patients. And another reason for integration, because often we have so little from a conventional medicine to offer them. I have so many elderly patients being sent off to some kind of cardiac conditioning program to get their shortness of breath to improve and, and then they'll come back and they don't really see much benefit. Um, whereas in an acupuncture setting, I think there are options. We need more studies, of course. We don't have enough studies to really understand fully what it, what it could do, but I think it's important. And I see, you know, already because of Medicare covering 
now low back pain, um, the, uh, the, the national organizations for licensed acupuncturists are working hard now with Congress and with Medicare to make licensed acupuncturists also approved Medicare providers. So that's gonna be another big change, I think, which is gonna happen maybe in the next year or so, where then more licensed acupuncturists can also bill Medicare, but then maybe that will also make it easier to integrate a licensed acupuncturist within a conventional setting with a conventional billing model of care um, and then give patients more options in this regard for, for treatment. Thank you, Dr. Dad. I think there's one more question. And there's also a comment from Rohini saying, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, the last question I think we'll take today is, how intensive is the acupuncture course, the number of years of training, and who all can learn physician specialty? Yeah, so this is a big subject. And depending who you talk to, it can be a little bit controversial. But the for non-physicians, so these are... Uh, people coming out of college, they may have a couple of courses um, in in the you know the biomedical sciences, but nothing really too deep. And they decide to go to acupuncture school, so that's a four-year training program. And there's a lot to learn. There's you know they have to learn anatomy. They have to learn you know how you know from a conventional standpoint, um, a lot of physiology and and how uh, pathology in terms of how things can go wrong. In addition, of course, they're learning acupuncture. And on top of that, a main uh, stay of their course load is in herbal therapies. So that's different than a physician. So a physician, the standard of care is, is essentially a year long course, but the physician is really not trying to learn herbal medicine. They're really just trying to learn acupuncture. And the style of acupuncture may be slightly different than would be learned in a in a in a licensed acupuncture school, but as as you can see, it can still be quite powerful, and so I think it's complementary. Now, it, I think there's been a fear that there's going to be some competition, but it's not the case. Physicians are way too busy to take over the work. We need more people doing acupuncture. Licensed acupuncturists, physicians, um, you know, have to get involved as well. But it's it's a different kind of training. And it's uh, the standard in the United States is 300 hours. Some states, like the state of Massachusetts, already considers acupuncture within the scope of your license. But then different hospitals like the Beth Israel or Mass General will still demand that 300 hour basic training, CME training, in order to be able to actually um, use acupuncture in a hospital. Um, and then many states actually have standardized that they require 300 hours for a physician. Thank you, Dr. Odette. Um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I think, you know, we can all think more about how these alternative and complementary therapies can enhance and work together with what, uh, you know, conventional medicine does. And I think Dr. Odette has posted a uh, website in the in the chat. Is that a website that can, you can be reached yes. at? Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And then also your email, jodat at acumed.org. I think that's a direct yeah. uh, line to reach Dr. Odat with it's further amazing. questions. Yeah. I see a lot of thank yous, informative and educational. Uh, people really enjoyed this talk. So thank you so much, Dr. Odat, for your yeah generous time and uh, for all of this wisdom that you shared with us today. Um, once again, thanks to everybody who joined us for this lovely talk. We have it recorded so that you can view it at a later point. It'll be shared on our website at some point as well. And uh, a easy way to stay in touch with, with us to know about future events and to hear from wonderful speakers like Dr. Odat is to just connect with us on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, that's the first place you'll find out about any updates from our center and you'll be the first to know about our upcoming speaker series as well. And speaking of this, uh, next month on August 31st, we have a really interesting talk looking at the impact of yoga on uh, you know, digestive disorders like irritable bowel syndrome. And we'll be looking at some of the research behind this and 
um, going a little bit more in depth into seeing what kind of outcomes and impacts our yoga makes possible. So uh, Dr. Maitrey Raman will be sharing uh, a wonderful lecture with us in a, about a month. She's from Calgary, Canada, and we look forward to having her. And you can uh, sign up for this uh, in a link that I'm going to share in the chat right now, along with a link for um, just being able to connect with us and sign up for our mailing list. So you can sign up on yoga for ibs.eventbrite.com. And for future events, you can use the link in the form or use this QR code to uh, share your interest with us. And we'll be sending about once a month an email with upcoming events. And you can always reach out to us via email if you have any ideas or want to collaborate with us in different ways. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Adet. It's been a pleasure hearing from you and learning about this, uh, you know, the confluence of these fields, one very, very traditional and old and right. something that's a much more modern. And um, let's see how, you know, we can continue to have conversations around this in the future. Thank you all for being right. with us I this hope evening. So. Yes. And right. have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.